Um, yeah. Can you can you hear me and see the screen well? Yes, it's fine. I can anyway. Yeah. Hopefully, I'll the same. Great. Uh, thank you. So, uh, hi everyone, and thank you, uh, Jeff, for the introduction and for the invitation to talk today. Uh, it's really great to see uh, a, a, to have a session about green computing at like a major a biology conference, like Roy was pointing out. Um, it's 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 also really interesting to to follow Roy's talk and, and uh, see the overlap with what I'll discuss. Uh, so I'll try to, to address the problem uh, with a slightly different angle, ju just focusing on the practical side of it. So as computational scientists, uh, how can we make our work more sustainable? And, uh, and the, I guess the question is, it, how hard is it really? Um, and hopefully I'll, I'll try to show some easy ways we can do it. Not, not everything is easy to adjust, but hopefully uh, yes, yeah, so, some of it will be. So uh, I, I guess I, I, I'm, preaching to the choir here when, when discussing the, the benefits of uh, and the importance of the problem. But some figures I, I, I find interesting um, is the uh, um, air pollution. It's, it's 4.2 million deaths per year, according to the World Health Organization. And it's about 91, it affects about 91% of the world population. Uh, and one of the big factor of that is greenhouse gases for which uh, electricity production is, is a major factor. Uh, and when, when we look at the energy scale, so these are um, uh, two or three years old estimates, but that, that gives an idea, and I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about ICT in general in, in the next talk, uh, but uh, data centers represent about 200 terawatt hour of energy per year, which if we use the, the average uh, um, carbon footprint of creating that, it's a about 100 megaton of, of CO2 per year. Which is um, which is well the same as the uh, American commercial aviation, so so definitely not negligible. The, the the big question that comes up every time I I um, talk about it is uh, what about what about bitcoins? Um, so so I decided to to just put a slide about that, and, and it's quite bad. So there's this tracker made by the University of Cambridge that's quite interesting, and we see that if Bitcoin was a country, it would use more energy than Austria, for example. So it's massive. It's not directly in competition with, with computational research as, as we do it, but it, it's still uh, something to be mindful of. Uh, and, and perhaps more importantly, it could power all British tea kettles for, for something like 15 years. Um, what a waste, really. But now if we move on to, to research, um, the, it, it's hard to really know how much computational research is done, but there's this um, resource, which is XSEED. So it's a network of, of supercomputers in American uh, institutions, and that, that's a way to mutualize resources so researchers can access uh, compute hours elsewhere. And they have like usage statistics. So, for example, last year, nine billion compute hours were charged. So that's not 24 million hours per calendar day, like one million hour every hour. I, I find that absolutely mind blowing. And and obviously, this led to like a lot of great discoveries. So, as Roy pointed out before, the the point here is not to say, oh, that shouldn't be done, not at all, but rather it's so huge that we need to take that into account uh, and just, just be a bit mindful of it. Um, so I guess the next question is why isn't there a widespread concern about that? Uh, obviously so some people are like, like creating these workshops and, and in, in AI as well, but there, there isn't like a widespread concern. And uh, I had a chance to chat uh, with Victoria Coles from Advanced Science News about it. And I think a few reasons could be, um, it's quite abstract, like the, the, the carbon footprint compared to like the smoke coming out of a car is not, is not so straightforward to, to visualize. Um, if you think of like things like fridges, dishwashers, TVs, cars, things like that, uh, they all promote sustainability or uh, low energy needs. It's, it's being or at least claiming to be environmentally friendly. It's a key element of an advertising campaign. And as well as a legal requir requirements in many cases. And, and we're not quite there yet for computers where the only argument would be, oh, it, it, the battery lasts longer, for example. Um, something I, I, I am definitely guilty of is that computing time is virtually free for a lot of scientists. Uh, we, we have access to large institutional servers. And, and so, yeah, we, we don't really see the uh, electricity bill at the end of the month or like, so it's, we'll be disconnected of the, of the cost of, of running a model overnight, for example. Um, 
And even for scientists who really want to estimate the carbon footprint, until recently, uh, this was excessively difficult to do so. They required extensive research on the env environmental impact of each component. Uh, and uh, yeah, with, without data, the problem uh, was mostly ignored. And I guess, um, reflecting on some reaction we received over the past, the past year and a half working on this, I'd add institutional friction in the sense that they still are there a widespread belief that it's not really a problem worth investigating? And, and I guess that's something that, that's to be expected when, when tackling a new field. But yeah, there's still some friction there that it's not that big a problem and it's not really research to, to look at that. So um, as, as Rory pointed out, so I'll, I'll move quite quickly on that. Uh, deep learning started to feel a bit guilty. So that's an example, just so you can, uh, if you're not familiar with it, the magnitude of uh, compute hours used. Uh, so it's the one of the last Google chatbot, and they train it for a full month using over two thousand processing calls, which are and which are, uh, yeah, they're, they're optimized calls. Um, so that's the and that's just to train the model once. That doesn't take into account optimization or or anything like that. So so uh, some concerns were raised. You can you can recognize here uh, Roy's manuscript Green AI. That's um, that really set the foundation. Uh, and the Stribble's article about NLP and um, a few a few other uh, papers, including the one on the bottom right about uh, on the dangers of stochastic parrots, which is one that uh, was raised internally actually from from the ethics team or well, the former ethics teams uh, at Google. So uh, there, there's some concern, but not that many. The fact that we always talk about the same papers from one talk to the next, I guess, is a sign that there aren't that many that many literature uh, that much literature about the topic it's, it's not only deep learning though uh, astronomy is doing the same um, and some serious work has been undertaken uh, mainly from australia uh, to look at the carbon footprint of of their field um, for example they estimate that an astronomer has a carbon footprint significantly greater than the average australian and surprising uh, and five times higher than the global average which is massive as we've seen australia is a bit of an extreme case because their energy comes from coal mainly so it's very um emits a lot of greenhouse gases uh but th there's a, a lot of work being being undertaken on that uh and so um that's why i think it's it's time for computational biology to to really to really crack on and do the same and and really start to uh, study uh well our contribution that's why that's why such a um, special session is great uh really to like catch up with other fields or but i mean a lot of fields are not starting to do that i haven't seen much work uh, in physics or, or or things like that so uh, it's really uh, really important to to get going on this um so we, we, we can all think that the impact of bioinformatics is significant. We, we all have examples of models that takes hours or days to, to run. Um, so out of curiosity, we benchmarked a variety of tools use, used in the field uh, to see the, the carbon footprints. And well, that's not, uh, that's not great. Uh, as you can see here, uh, many analysis uh, emit over 50 kilograms of CO2, over 100 kilograms. Um, and if we zoom out, uh, we, we need to zoom out to actually fit a large scale GWAS uh, in the frame, um, which is closer to like 500 to like a ton of CO2 emitted. Um, I won't get into like details about which each analysis is comprised of, um, but it's just to have an overview that this is a problem and, and yeah, they, uh, bioinformatics has a role to play. But if you're interested into the details here, um, do check out uh, this preprint on bioarchive. Uh, there's a lot of cool results in this work led by Jason Greedy from the Baker Institute uh, and with help of, uh, from a lot of people in the lab. So um, yeah, do check out if you, if you want to look at it. But today we'll, we'll mostly focus about looking at our own emissions rather than like uh, benchmarks. Um, so, all right, hopefully by now I vaguely convinced some of you that uh, we should all more, uh, look more closely at the carbon footprint of our work. Um, and I guess the, the next question is where to start. Um, and I mentioned that before, it, today is very much a data-driven world. So no data, no problem. Uh, so the, the, first, the first step is to estimate our own footprint. And that's where it gets messy. Um, we can think about the power consumption of our computer, but then which one are we really talking about? Um, and then we start diving into the components. Again, which ones are important, which ones are not. 
Uh, and, and then what about the electricity? Where is it coming from? Does the time of day impact? And there are lots of questions. And, and each, each of these questions is a, a rabbit hole and quite a deep one, uh, I, I can tell you, especially when, when your background is not in, in sustainability uh, for, in IT. Uh, so understandably, when trying to tackle that, it can look tough, time consuming, not, not really worth it and uh, almost impossible. So, uh, which I think boils down to the lack of a standardized way to estimate the carbon footprint, but something aimed at non-experts, uh, at, at scientists who can be in biology like here today, or, or physics or, or medicine, whatever. Um, but some, something common that basically everyone knows how to do it just by putting the effort. And although in research, we do like, we do love creating a new standard or a new framework, um, more important than that is that people use it. And for that, maybe actually we, we don't necessarily need a framework, but we mostly need a tool, something that makes it easy for people to do it and, and spend less time calculating it and more time thinking how to, uh, what to do about it, how to reduce this carbon footprint. So I'll try to highlight kind of like quick tips and uh, best practice in these green bubbles throughout uh, the talk. Um, but yes. We, we, when we looked at it, uh, they, they, outside of a couple of tools made specifically for deep learning and not really applicable to, to other computational research, um, they, there isn't much, they, they, yeah, there was no tool out there and, and computational research as we've seen it is like much wider than just machine learning. Uh, so, so that's why we decided to make one. Um, so that was, um, uh, a solution, it comes as a, an open source, completely free online calculator. So we developed that with Jason Greeley and Mike, uh, and Mike Inouye. Um, and the, the idea is fairly simple. Uh, if, if you go on this link, you can check it out. It's just, uh, you just input basic information about your model and your hardware. Um, and, and it tells you what's the associated carbon impact. So in CO2 equivalent, which is just a way to, what would be the quantity of CO2 with the same impact on, on uh, climate change. Or on, on global warming, um, and some some equivalents, for example, how long it would take a mature tree to absorb to sequester that much CO two, or to drive, or to fly, things like that, just to put it into context. Um, you can also see how it splits, how much is due to processor, how much is due to memory, uh, and and compare you can to other locations. But of course, um, we, we said what's important is a tool, but it's also important to explain how it's done so that people can trust the results. Or, or interested people can really dive in and, and see, oh, okay, that's, that's how it's calculated. Um, so we, we published an article in Advanced Science, um, which presents the methodology and, and basically explains how, why we did things that way. And it's also, we, we just demonstrate how it works for, for a few things like physics, weather forecast, um, things like that. Uh, so then we can just scroll down and um, yeah, there are lots of options. The idea is that you can really tailor it to your work. So if you work on your laptop, you can work like that. But if you use a data center in your university, same thing. Or if you use cloud computing, it also works. There are lots of, lots of different options, uh, but uh, the, it's, hopefully designed in a way that default options are still all right. So you don't need to know everything to use it. You, you can also always leave default option. The, the estimate may be a bit more generous or overestimating slightly, but it still works quite nicely. Um, and, and some quick explanations uh, for, you know, uh, of how it works if you don't want to uh, dive into the manuscript. And there's even like at the end, a text model on how to report it. So if you want to say, okay, I just want to include this paragraph, Here's, uh, here's what you can do about it. Um, so yeah, it, we made sure it works on mobiles and tablets, so really no excuse not to use it. And, and again, it's, the, it's all about uh, trust and making sure that it's, it's openly available. So all the code, all the data is open source on GitHub so people can raise issues, uh, ask questions and things like that. Um, so we were uh, quite glad. So we launched it, uh, well, uh, way over a year ago now in March 2020. And it's been nice to see uh, that they, they basically a consistent uptake on, on the tool and uh, over 3000 people have visited it uh, from all over the world. Um, and it's not only when we publi or public, publish a release that there's a peak, but there, there's yeah, consistent uh, usage uh, week over week. So that seems to confirm what we thought, which is, uh, scientists do care about it and and are and want to be more mindful of their own footprint. Uh, they just need the right the right tool to do so. 
Uh, just here, I guess a legitimate question at this point is whether these estimates are actually accurate at all, or is it just a, a, you know, a bit too easy to just plug in numbers and, and give you an estimate? Um, and and it's, uh, here, I'll, I'll mention the, the paper uh, the, from Google, uh, Roy pointed out, uh, which is um, somehow a reaction to the uh, stochastic parrots paper, which, which, uh, which caused a bit, a bit of drama. Uh, and, and so they, they, they wanted to promote the sustainability of their, of their large scale model. So um, basically what's, what's interests me here is that in the process of doing that, uh, they measured experimentally the energy usage of, this, um, of the servers for different tasks, which is something they can really easily do, which is normally quite hard, but because they have the data centers, they have all the infrastructure, they can actually plug in a, 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 um, something, a device and say, okay, well, that's how much energy is used by this, this computer to, do, to train this model. So they can have accurate estimations. Um, and they compared it to the estimations provided by, by the Green Algorithms uh, app, which is in green here. Um, so ideally, we would like a ratio as close to one as possible. And there are two things worth noting. Um, one is when we look at these ones, uh, it, it's for experiments using commercial GPUs like the P100 or the V100, if you're familiar with it, it's basically just NVIDIA's uh, commercial uh, graphical units. Um, the, the estimations from the green algorithm are, are remarkably close to the real values. I was quite surprised myself. Um, so, so it's really encouraging to see to see how that the estimations are, are sensible and all the hypotheses kind of make sense. Um, but obviously, uh, then then the eye is drawn to these values up there, where it's it's where the estimation is overestimating uh, by a factor two about the uh, the real consumption. And actually, the real difference here is that all these experiments are run on Google's own TPUs, which are their their own um, graphical units. And while the uh, power consumption is normally a public information, so for any commercial units, they call that thermal design power. It's, it's basically you, uh, an information you, they provide because people need to know how much power they need to deliver to their, to their computer. Uh, but in the case of Google, because it's their own chips and that's something only having their own data center, that's a well-kept secret. So there's some leaks. And so that's, we, we were based on estimate, there is no official information. Um, so what that means is that transparency really is key. And I'm, I'm quite happy with these results, actually. That shows that when the information is made available uh, and, and the vast majority, I would assume, of uh, computational biology work is, is done on, uh, on, on either CPUs or, or commercial GPUs rather than uh, on, on TPUs, uh, the, the estimation and the tool works really well. Um, and also we can, we can now adjust the Google's TPU now that we have a bit more uh, information about their, their power usage. But that really shows how important it is for, to be transparent for companies and for, for everyone, everyone involved. So yeah, now we know it, it works. Um, and, and that leads us to how to make it more, uh, how to make our work more sustainable in general um, now that we can measure it. Um, Broadly, we can divide the environmental impact of computing into three. Um, we, we have powering the computer during the task. So, you know, during running a GWAS or whatever, during the task, it's the power that goes to the computer. That's the first thing we think about. Uh, two things we, we tend to forget a bit is long-term data storage. Uh, so yeah, all these uh, data stored for, for over a year, over many years. And there's also the life cycle footprint of the hardware. So uh, cradle to, to grave. So producing the hardware, uh, using it, sorry, and, and uh, disposing of it. So let's start with this, with this last point. Um, in general, for most consumer devices, 70 to 80% of the cradle to grave impact is from producing for production or only. Uh, so that shows that actually charging the device every day or, or disposing of it has quite a small impact there. Uh, that also shows that uh, the best thing you can do to keep your, to, to reduce the footprint is to keep your devices for longer. So repair them, reuse them, but really avoiding this initial production uh, impact is, is the most impactful thing you can do. So here's just a few, a couple of examples of the 
life cycle um, footprint of, of a laptop and, a, and an iPhone with the limitation that it comes from uh, Apple's own reports. So, so hasn't been like assessed um, externally. Um, moving on to long-term data storage. Um, again, that depends on the data centers and, and most efficient, uh, uh, the more efficient uh, uh, cloud providers, for example, it, it will be a different split, but on average, uh, for all the power and all the energy provided to a data center, half of it will be used to power the servers. 10% um, will be for storage and the remaining 40% will be overhead. So mainly cooling the facilities and then a bit for light, uh, lightning, uh, lighting and, and things like that. Um, so this 40% is what, what uh, data centers try to really to reduce because it's, it's wasting money somehow um, because it's not powering computations. So, but this 10% for storage, if, if we take 10% of the, of the 200 um, terawatt hours we, we mentioned at the start, that's still a, a, as much electricity as a country like Iceland or Tunisia. So, so that's still a, a significant chunk of, of energy. Um, and, and it's hard to give a number of how much, what's the carbon footprint of, of a terabyte, but because it fluctuates on a lot, but as a, as a rule of thumb or a, a, an order of magnitude to keep in mind, uh, around 10 kilograms of um, CO2 per terabyte and per year is, is uh, something that's, uh, that's sensible uh, based on, on some manufacturers' um, reports. And, and so that leads naturally to the last, to, to a new tip, don't, don't uh, store useless data. And, and just keeping, you know, when, when data are really not useful anymore, it, it can help to uh, not uh, keep them on the drives. All right, so that, that uh, we get to the heart of the problem really, and that's where we can, we can play with it a bit more, which is the cost of powering the computers during an analysis. So I won't, I won't do the details of how, how we calculate it, but just, just to show you where you can really have an impact. Um, an easy way to look at it is the carbon footprint. The total one, it's how much energy uh, is drawn by the computer to run the model, and then how, what's the carbon footprint of producing this energy. So the energy drawn, it only depends on the efficiency of the hardware and the algorithm itself, that's it. And the second part, it mainly depends on where you're located. What's the energy mix of your country? How is the energy produced? And that decides what's the carbon footprint of producing such, uh, such electricity. So uh, for the first one, I'll, I'll just show that quickly, but uh, it, again, if you want the details to, to check out the, the methods paper, but it mainly depends on the running time. Uh, it's not a big surprise here. Um, so it's, this one's fairly obvious. If you optimize your code to run faster or use optimized code, then, then you will reduce the carbon footprint. Uh, interestingly, sometimes this can be, as we saw quickly at the start, uh, this is just two GWAS, the same GWAS run with the first version, version of Bolt LMM or the, the 2.3 version of Bolt LMM. And we can see that because they sped up, they, they make it much faster. Um, the, it reduces the, just update, uh, updating the software reduces the carbon footprint substantially uh, by at least three, uh, threefold. So uh, sometimes it can be just as easy as that. And it's worth checking that you are still using the last version and maybe putting a bit of effort to updating to the next, upgrading to the last one, even if it, it, it yeah, it requires a bit of work. Uh, then it's just the, the uh, power drawn by the different components. And, and we, we figured out that actually the only ones that really matter are the processing cores and the memory. So either CPUs or GPUs and, and the memory. Um, and finally, the efficiency of the data center. So that's what I was uh, talking about, about cooling the facilities. Um, I guess the, the main question here is how efficient is the data center you use for your work? Or, and if you don't know, how easy it is for you to find this information. Sometimes it will be displayed on, on your institution's website uh, or just a quick email will get you the answer or sometimes it's a bit more hidden, but it's worth investigating that so you know where you start from. Is your data center already really good? In this case, well, that's a good starting point or is it really bad? And then it's worth working on that first because no matter how optimized your code is, if every time you, you, you run for one minute, you know, it, it takes an extra 50% of energy just, just to cool the facilities, for example, um, 
yeah, it may maybe you would be, be better off using uh, another another facility. So that's this kind of question that's that are worth asking. And just very quickly, because that's a problem that's really important in computational biology, where we have such weird, such large memory requirements, which is the memory available is actually the only thing that matters uh, to decide the carbon footprint, almost, uh, it's, but it's a good estimate. So over-allocating memory just to be safe, which is something I've, I've definitely done uh, a lot, um, is actually very detrimental to, to the environment. And, and so that's an easy step, just making sure you allocate the right amount of, like the right quantity of resources to, to the task is, is an easy fix. All right, so that's the energy need. And then the, the question is, how do we, um, how is this electricity produced? And that's, as I said, depends on the location mainly. And it varies greatly between countries. You can see here, use, doing the exact same task, the exact same analysis in Australia versus Switzerland, it will emit a baffling 74 times more carbon dioxide. Just, just doing it. Um, just because Australia is powered by coal and, and Switzerland by hydro mainly. Uh, so location is, if you have the possibility to choose the location either by, by using um, computing a partner university or using cloud computing, for example, this is a great way to limit, um, to limit your impact. Uh, and if you want to check out how green or how or not green your, your country is, electricity, electricity map sorry, is, is a great resource. Uh, they don't have all countries, but it changes over time. It just depends on where the live information is, is available. And you can check out where the, the electricity is coming from and exchanges between countries and things like that. So it's, it's a really, really informative uh, resources. Um, and that, yeah, that, that shows the importance of choosing the computing facility. And I guess just as a quick example of why carefully to choose your computing facility is important and why carefully. So we looked at uh, the European Center for Weather Forecasting and they're moving the data center from Reading in the UK to Bologna in Italy. And, and the, the highlight, the, the headline was uh, to a much more efficient data center. So a brand new one with the overhead cost about cooling and things like that we mentioned much lower than, than the in the previous uh, data center. So that's, that sounds all great, but actually, the carbon intensity, so the, the energy mix in Italy is, is much worse than the one in the UK. Uh, and if they don't do anything about that, it would completely offset the potential gain of, uh, with respect to efficiency, uh, which would make the, the move actually less sustainable. Uh, so that's this kind of like pitfalls that are really worth keeping in mind um, when, when choosing a computing facility. So um, as we said, uh, it's really important to, uh, it's important to estimate and, and be transparent about it. So that the more people will start reporting their carbon footprint, the more we will, uh, it will hopefully like uh, kick off a, a virtuous cycle of, of trying to uh, optimize it. And also if you estimate it beforehand, you can include it in cost benefits analysis, uh, benefit analysis, sorry for the typo. Um, and, the, the idea is the same way that, you know, if you have a very expensive, um, very expensive uh, experiment to run, uh, you, would, uh, you would say, okay, well, is it really worth it? Uh, will I put all this money into it? And, and that's the same idea with the carbon cost. Is it obviously in many cases, it will still be worth it and that's perfectly fine. But it's just posing for a minute and wondering, is it worth all these emissions for this, for this work? All right, so, but if you estimate it, well, the, as I said, the best way is to estimate your own carbon footprint rather than what we did at the start, what I mentioned, which is those benchmarks. So you look at other people's work, but really estimating your own footprint is, is the most accurate way to do it. And it was, it was interesting to see um, the, the team behind the new Region EG was algorithm doing it, and they released a new version of it recently. Um, funnily enough, uh, Twitter thought it was too shocking to be displayed. But yeah, so they, they compare the different tools and, and that, makes, that makes another compelling argument for this tool. Not, not only it is more efficient, but also it's more carbon friendly. And hopefully that can be another selling point for, for, for efficient algorithms. And, and that just, uh, and, the final, and, and the final thing for the real carbon is, uh, we talked about a little bit, but how many times do you really run it? Is it just a one-off analysis or is it something that will run often? or there are lots of debugging involved, or um, 
or, or things um, or things like that. So it's just something to keep in mind. We call that pragmatic scaling factor, but yeah. And I guess the, the lesson here is only run what you really need to and not, you know, oh, let's try a new optimization just for the off chance I can save a percent of accuracy or things like that. Um, so a few interesting things we've learned along the way. Uh, more calls is not always better. And, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with that, but there's a sweet spot. So you can see the blue curve or the green curve. Green curve is um, running time and you can see it keeps decreasing, but going in the orange curve is carbon footprint. And going for, for example, for from 30 to 60 calls, the, the gain in running time is, is insignificant, but it, you, you, multiply, you almost, yeah, you increase the carbon footprint by 50%. So that's this, this situation that it's worth tracking down. And, and yeah, in, in, in some cases, it's not worth adding always more calls. The same logic is true for CPUs versus GPUs. GPUs will often be massively faster for, for suitable tasks and, in, in, and, be, and hence be, being uh, also more, more efficient, uh, more carbon efficient. But in some cases, adding more GPUs will, will be detrimental to the environment. So, so things to keep in mind. Memory matters, as we said, for example, we can see here 32 gigabytes of memory. It draws as much power as a core i7, which is something most of you, uh, a lot of you probably have in your laptop as just the processing core. So just one core of it. Uh, so yeah, that's that's quite interesting. And and it's important to make the, uh, the information available. So people who want to pick a, a software or, or, or a data center based on energy efficiency, uh, and hopefully there will be more and more people like that, then they need the information to be able to make uh, the decisions. So that's what we said about data center efficiency or memory requirements or things like that. It's, it's important to make the information available. Uh, and offsetting is a, is, a, is a difficult topic. It's just the fact of buying green energy to, uh, to make up for the, the, the carbon you emitted. Uh, and it's, it should really be a last resort, uh, a last resort because we, we don't re it, it's quite unclear how efficient it will really be down the line. So it's, it comes after reducing emissions and after doing everything else. But when it's done, uh, so someone in the lab did that for one of the projects. Uh, it's just it's great to see, to see that done. Um, I, I would go quickly on that, but it's just in case you're interested in lab sustainability in general, in, especially uh, wet labs, uh, I'm sure many of you are. In this case, uh, there's this podcast that's really interesting uh, where they, they explore easy fix and, and practical tips on how to reduce the plastic and carbon footprint of, of wet labs. And we had, a, we, we, we had a chat with them and we were invited in one of the episodes to talk about the IT side and that was quite interesting. And also there are lots of initiatives in, in lots of universities. So for example, here we have a few in, in, in the Netherlands, but they, they are uh, all over Europe and probably all over the world. Uh, so it's, it's usually student led groups, but they are really try to promote best practices in wet labs uh, or, or in research labs. Um, so what's needed next? Uh, I'll, I'll conclude quickly on that. Uh, removing frictions further, although it does, although the app, I think, hopefully is a, a step in the right direction and makes it easy, it is still sometimes too much hard work because there are lots of different jobs being run and we don't really keep track of everything and we don't know how many processors we, it's just complicated. What we want is a button, we click on it and it tells you this is your carbon footprint for the month. That's that's the dream. Um, and, and so we, tried it and we tried to implement it uh, so on Cambridge CSD3 which is our uh, HPC cluster um, so it's not a button because it's, it's a, a command line thing but it's, it's the equivalent so you just run that you say what's my carbon footprint between 1st of January here and, and 1st of June um, and that displays something like that which is arguably a lot less pretty than the app but it has all the information um, although some so it also allows a great level of detail it can tell you how like what kind of if you allocate too much memory what how much carbon it costed and it can also tell you the cost of failed jobs uh, which is something i wish i ignore uh, but it's it's yeah you have all this information and you can really dive in and so um that's quite a I, I, yeah i find that quite exciting to be able to see all the details like really easily so um this is still a beta version we're still trialing it but uh, all the code is already on github uh, with guidelines on how to implement it in your own cluster because obviously this is tailored to each cluster we can't make a tool uh, general that's the, the drawback of having something easy to use 
but if you're interested in implementing that in your own cluster, please do get in touch. Um, you, you can check the GitHub, but I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to help out if I can. Um, and in general, I guess what we need is more transparency from everyone involved, really. So institutions, uh, data centers, cloud providers, hardware manufacturers, and obviously us as well, who, um, who, do, the, who do the work. So just, just communicating more about the carbon footprint of the different projects, uh, of the, the efficiency of the data centers, and things like that. Um, all right, so sorry for running a bit, but I'd like to thank all our collaborators who helped us along the way. So lots of people in Cambridge, Melbourne, different funding bodies. And if you have questions, suggestions on how to improve the different tools, or you know, we'd like some new features or, or yeah, feel free to just reach out. We'd be very happy to discuss about that. And uh, I try to post regular updates of the tools or the new features or how it works and things like that on Twitter uh, where they're like short summaries. So thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to taking your questions. Wow, thank you, Loic. That was a fabulous, uh, fabulous presentation. Very, very clear and very wide reaching. So, and it's, as you might expect, it's generated a few questions, which is great. Um, so rather than me head, head off, I thought um, I, I'll try, un I think I can unmute people and get them to ask it directly rather than me ask it for them. So I'm gonna try that with Matus. Matthias, um, you're going to be able to answer that live? Uh, maybe not. Allowed to talk. There he is. Oh, yes. Now I could unmute. Yeah. Okay. I had to unmute you. There we go. Yeah. So I'm wondering about this uh, carbon intensity calculations or the numbers that that you use in in green algorithms because i saw that there are many sources provide very different numbers for different countries and then also many sources concentrate on like what what the local intensities are in different regions of a country and so on which may be quite different so the example could be canada where quebec is uh, the opposite yeah. of alberta probably. so uh we're using the carbon footprint report so it's it's a uh, it's a um, uh, non-profit called carbon footprint and they yeah so they assemble a report mainly from basically they pull data from government reports about the energy mix and they and they calculate it so that's good because they calculate it in a um, consistent way across different countries uh, for large country the example of canada so if you go on the uh, on the app for example you can see that when you select canada um can't remember but i think we have several regions for canada so it will offer different regions and when we have the information for example, for, for some uh, US states, we have the information per state. So it will be a different, and you're right, it, it varies massively. Um, for some countries, we just have one value for the entire country. Uh, so yeah, it, it depends on the on the data we have. But as much as possible, we try to make it specific to different regions if we can. Mm, cool. Uh, my second question was related to that. I mean, if it's, if the differences are really very big, as can see in this data that you use in green algorithms. I mean, if it's that simple, isn't really the solution just moving all the calculations we do here to Norway or other countries with a similar low carbon footprint of the electricity production? I mean, it is sadly like a very effective way to, like if, if you do research, for example, in Australia, you can divide your, your carbon footprint by like 70 fold just by like moving your data to Switzerland and obviously it's it's complicated in some cases and in many especially in biology in many cases you can't move the data and the data is stuck where where you are um, and I guess there would be as people doing doing environment work would tell you that if there are massive migration like that they would have some edge effects but I, I don't think so many researchers will start doing that that we will have like downsides to to this mm -hmm. but, it is. Uh, but so I would say yes moving moving facility is 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 a great way to do it. Yeah, because maybe one comment to that I would have is that, that very typically kind of funding for for HPC is part of the research that, that we're doing, the research funding. Yeah. And then, I mean, we are kind of, yeah, we're getting funds to buy computers or to use some HPC facilities somewhere and the countries. Yeah, are, yeah, no, of course. There are so, lots of constraints. So would it be possible to kind of, instead of asking for getting funding to buy new computers, in Australia or in Germany, instead to ask to fund a compute center in Norway or Switzerland. Yeah, I mean, when it's possible, it's 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 good. Yeah. 
Yeah, it might, it might not be politically possible, but it certainly would yeah, be a good thing course. to do. Maybe yeah. we should start trying. The political solution, of course, is to get all countries on the same grounds as uh, as Norway and Sweden, uh, Switzerland. Um, yeah, okay, so there's another question. There's Marcella. I don't know if you want to ask that in uh, Marcella de Vila. If I allow you to talk, would you like to ask a question? You're still there? Hopefully, I've unmuted you. Uh, I can, I can, if you want, I can start answering it. Uh, Ask to unmute. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, in the, okay. Well, that's fine. So the question is. Okay. Just ask uh, it. Just answer it anyway. Yes. I think maybe she's not going to. Yeah. Ask. So how to convince data centers to implement a more carbon friendly footprint system when it's not their priority. Um, by, by asking them about it and they make as, as users by making it your priority. Uh, I mean, the, the only reason if you, uh, I don't want to, to be mean. One of the main reasons why, why Google communicates so much about the amazing POE, so the amazing, amazing efficiency of the data centers is because it's a selling argument. And then companies will go to them and saying, oh, see, we use efficient data centers. And, and that's one of the drawbacks of the PUE nowadays is it became a marketing argument. So people just find ways to cheat about it rather than like calculate it in a scientific manner. Um, so if, if, you know, if, if when choosing a data center, you're like, okay, well, I, I need to know how efficient it is because if I don't, you know, it's one of the key, key reason why I pick a data center. If many people do it, then data centers will do it for the same. They start communicate about it. If, if, if everyone is like, oh, well, that's good if it's there, but I don't mind if it's not, then yeah, you're right. People won't do it. But if, if researchers and like institutions, and that's probably more institution than researchers because they have more weight. But if institutions start putting their weight behind it and be like, well, that's a key element of how we decide our, our HPC provider, then hopefully they will start implementing it because it will be good business. Okay, that's, yeah, that's a, that's a great discussion. Yeah, so yeah, I'm gonna say Marcella says she can't speak because she's in a noisy environment, but you've answered her question, which is great. So are there any other questions um, coming up? from anyone because we're coming to the end of the time oh, oh there's a hand up adrian's got his hand up so why don't you just ask your question then? yeah no really really great talk um i don't know how i'm going to follow you guys um <laughs> i just wondered uh if you i love the tool by the way uh and i i really find it compelling this idea that more accountability for you know could lead to some back pressure if people are moving their computation to lower the footprint and and you know that could be a good thing in it so i was wondering whether you were going to join your two things up so you've got the profiling tool and the estimator are you going to let people upload profiles um i mean there's probably some commercial sensitivity uh, that make that a little tricky but um i like the idea of saying you know this characterizes my compute and my my workloads uh, what's that going to look like or do you think the approximation is enough uh what, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, what do you mean by profiles? Oh, sorry. I mean like a trace-driven um, record of of uh, your compute instances. So, it, so it's quite it's quite common to kind of log, you know, how many cores did you use and what utilization did you get and these, these kind of things. In memory footprint. Yeah. No, I I did it. That yeah, exactly. So that's what the last thing I showed the one on the CSD three cluster on the common light argument, the yeah. black one. Uh, that's what it's doing. It's using logs mm -hmm. of of past work. Um, mm. there, there, is a, there is the issue that HPC facilities are not very keen on everyone communicating on that. But again, it, if, it's, if it comes from, from, from like more, more um, the researchers will to share their information, it probably will be fine. I guess it's, each researcher can decide to either just say, oh, this project we present, just acknowledging this is the carbon footprint of it, which would be a way to do it. But also labs or department can say, okay, well, all together, the carbon footprint of what we conduct in this year is that, and we will try to offset it, or we will try to, um, I mean, the, the more it's embraced, I think the, the better, but it will very much depends on how much researchers and, and departments and labs are willing to, to take on, I guess. Absolutely. I, I was on a, I'm not to take up too much time, but I was on a funding panel recently where grants had to talk about their carbon footprint as part of the funding decision. Uh, right down to kind of meal catering and stuff and you, you you could imagine exactly 
you know, following on from this, right, we're going to profile what we're doing, we're going to disclose it openly, and I think that could lead to a, an important change of culture. Actually. Yeah, I mean, that that would be great. I guess the two who have, like, a big weight is journals and, and grants who can push for Absolutely. that because, because they have some power. But I'll let yeah, you 